Yeah. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazir. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Egg Whisperer Show. Tonight's episode is titled The Secret Shh of IVF Stimulation. So I want you to relax wherever you are if you're driving. Relax, did you hear what I just said? Take a look at this. I am not uh, a product sponsor for this wine, but I just thought it was fun. I saw it in my favorite store, Target, and so I just had to buy it and bring it tonight. So relax. Have a seat and enjoy. I think I'm going to pour some in my mug. Do you see what it says? Dr. Amy at your cervix? Yes. Someone did actually make that for me. Isn't that fun? I'm kidding. I'm not going to drink wine as I'm talking. So tonight's show is titled The Secrets of IVF Stimulation. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this tonight is because if you're a patient of mine, you're going to get all my secrets. And in fact, one of my favorite patients dedicated a blog to her entire IVF cycle with me as her doctor. I think IVF is fun. I thought it was kind of clever that she titled the website is very fun. And so my patients actually benefit from her experience through her IVF cycle. But I realize that not everyone has access to the website, to me. And so I want to make sure that everyone can learn from my secrets tonight. And so if you have questions, you want to call in, feel free to do so. This has also been a really fun week. I've been in the news over, uh, or about a couple stories. One is a Tinder type app to pick sperm donors. Doesn't that sound brilliant? I mean, just find some random sperm donor online that you've never met before. You don't know his family. You don't know what you know, genetic problems he might have. You don't know what infectious disease problems with you, you know, he might have. Make a baby without a lawyer, no. Not smart at all. So while technology is you know, going very rapidly as far as matching people together to make families, and we call that co-parenting, there are great ways of doing that with the help of a doctor. So if you think you want to be a mom or a dad and find someone through one of these websites, bring that match to your local fertility doctor. Guess what? We'll be open to that because we want you to be safe. We want you to have the healthiest pregnancy possible with the least number of surprises and only joy down the line. Another study that I was interviewed, or not study, but another story I was interviewed for was about egg freezing and how Facebook and Apple have basically changed how we talk about egg freezing. And what I told them is that egg freezing is now less taboo of a topic. I mean, we can talk about it at the dinner table and people don't whisper about how it's taboo or not something that women should consider doing. So if you're my friend, you know I basically walk around saying, get your levels checked, get your levels checked. Hi, did you just have a baby? Get your levels checked. Oh, hi, are you on birth control pills? Get your levels checked. Had an IUD placed? Get your levels checked. Just had a baby? Thinking about another one? Get your levels checked. So if you've never met me before, please get your levels checked. It's a simple blood test. You can do it around your cycle. You don't even have to be cycled. Cycling to get an AMH level checked. You can track it over time so that you're not surprised once you're ready to have a baby if your levels show that you are running out of eggs. Okay, so you're at the starting line of your IVF cycle. So what you wanna do when you're at that starting line is you wanna know, why am I here? How did I get here? Have I done all the tests possible or needed to understand what might happen. You know, my patients ask me all the time, what might happen during my IVF cycle? What could go wrong? And I don't like talking about what could go wrong. I like talking about, well, what could we learn? Well, we could learn that maybe this isn't the right protocol. You might not get as many eggs as we originally thought. You might not get as many embryos as originally thought, but whatever we learn, it's gonna make us better and help us get that much closer to our goal. And there are a number of tests that you can do now. I used to tell people that an IVF cycle was actually the most comprehensive fertility diagnostic test that you can do. It's one way to actually see how the egg and sperm look. 
and that's the only way. But I would say that there are a lot of tests that you can do now, fertility gene tests on both men and women, that can potentially predict what you might or what might happen with your embryos. So let's say you did a fertility gene test for the sperm and you found out that you might have less, bl less blastocysts than originally expected. Well, maybe that might guide you to consider doing more than one cycle or at least a better set of expectations so that you wouldn't be surprised or disappointed if you got less embryos than you originally thought. So you're back at the starting line and you're wondering, well, how am I gonna start this? Well. I'm actually the worst cook ever, like awful, horrible. I can't cook anything. I can't bake a cookie. I am a master chef though, and I make a mean momlet. Get it? Momlet, omelet, but mom, I know you got it. So whenever I think of making embryos, I think, okay, well, you know, you think of these people who are like amazing bakers, and then they can like add a little something, something to make their eggs or their uh, cookies just a little chewy or add a little something to make a little salty. But then at the end of the day, it's a cookie. So while I'm here sharing my IVF secrets, when you're seeing a fertility doctor, you really want to rely on their expertise. One of the things I say, or one of the many things I say is, don't believe everything you read. Just because you see it on a blog or on a YouTube show doesn't mean that it's true or applicable for you. So your fertility doctor knows your body the best. So be sure to ask them why, 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 and why. Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they making the cupcake, get it? Baking a cup, no, no. So make sure you know everything about the sperm and egg before you are actually embarking on your cycle. So back to starting the cycle and starting stimulation. Everyone wants to be natural. I mean, especially in California, who doesn't? We wanna be as natural as possible. And there's this idea out there that less is more. Well, certainly less is more in certain cases. So one thing that can confuse many people is they don't understand why when you're doing IVF, you actually need to take injections. Why can't you just show up and have your eggs retrieved. Well, the reason why you can't do that is because you have to basically grow, or what I say, cook the eggs. They have to mature. Only mature eggs can turn into an embryo. So once eggs are retrieved, the mature egg is then either frozen, if you're doing egg freezing, or turned into an embryo at the same time, and that's what we call IVF. And the other thing is that you have to take medications because naturally your body's only gonna send enough of an FSH signal to your ovary so that you ovulate one egg a month, right? And so I'm sitting up there on my life guard post sending out little tiny life vests to all the eggs because I consider myself an egg rescuer. I'm rescuing eggs from being lost. They're lost every day. It doesn't matter if you're on birth control pills, if you're breastfeeding, if you're pregnant, women, lose eggs. We have a finite supply and going through a fertility treatment, even if it's not IVF, basically is a way of saving eggs from something that just automatically and naturally happens. So that's why you actually have to take fertility hormones. And the hormones are higher doses of FSH than your brain is sending to your ovary. So while your brain sends a certain level to ovulate one egg, remember I just said that, you have to take the shots so that you ovulate more. So this is what an ovary looks like. So to you, you probably see a bunch of, you know, black circles and lots of, you know, grayness around there. So to me, I see something just so beautiful, right? And so to me, those are follicles, teeny tiny, basically balloons, and each balloon contains one egg inside. And so while you're taking the medications, those follicles are growing from a small size to a size closer to about two centimeters before the egg is extracted. So when you're trying to figure out, well, what are my chances before I go into this cycle, you have to remember that you're not a bunny. We're just human beings. And each egg is not a baby. Each egg is a chance for a baby. And that chance is basically determined by your age. I have a very sensitive clicker today. Very, very sensitive. So at the start of your cycle, 
sometimes people need birth control pills. And the first thing people do is look at me like, I've lost my mind. Amy, I want to have a baby. Why are you prescribing birth control pills? And so I want birth control pills to be rebranded when it comes to IVF. They really should be called IVF readiness pills, right? Because we're not trying to prevent you from getting pregnant. We're just trying to get your ovaries ready. So there are a lot of different ways of starting IVF. So there's a natural cycle start. There's a birth control pill start. There's something that sounds super sexy, estrace priming start, right? Doesn't that sound sexy? You can also do testosterone priming. So the way you start a cycle is determined by a number of things. I'll just tell you what I do. So we know that if a woman takes birth control pills, potentially she might get less eggs. So let's think about this. If you're older and you already have a lower number of eggs, well, for me, it doesn't make sense to start you on birth control pills. I do have patients that need the birth control pills, even if they have a lower number of eggs, and that is if they have a very set schedule. For example, they can only be available on very certain days and have their retrieval fall on a very certain day. And so starting with birth control pills gives them the opportunity to plan their cycle even months in advance. To do a natural cycle start, you have to be very flexible. Once your period starts, you start meds on cycle day number two. So you have to kind of be available, ready to come into my office, you know, be able to call me, let's say, the first thing in the morning and come in that day so that we can take a look at your ovaries, take a look at your hormone levels and make sure that the plane is ready for takeoff. You know, like when you're sitting on that tarmac and you have to have everything checked to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect before you start the plane. Well, that's the same thing when it comes to starting an IVF cycle. So the other thing is every center, every doctor is different. So some centers actually don't have the flexibility to do natural cycle starts, but I'm a little bit different. Next time I think I need to wear a shirt, I should go that direction, that says, if your ovaries are working, so am I. So it doesn't matter if it's Sunday, if it's Memorial Day, if it's Thanksgiving, if your ovaries working, I'm going to be there too. So that's why I can offer natural cycle starts to my patients because I don't, let's say, batch cycles. That's something that a lot of even excellent centers, they do for a number of reasons. So before you start your IVF cycle, remember I said, ask why, 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 and then why and why. Why am I on this protocol? Why did you choose this protocol for me? And if you, if you start off with that, then you're gonna be more informed, know why things are happening, the way they're happening, so that you can be a part of the process rather than feel like something is actually happening to you. So let's say you wanna do IVF. So in order to plan the stimulation, you have to make a calendar. So that's me, no, that's not me, but I will make a calendar for you. We can do it in person, we can do it over video call or a phone call, and I will actually mock up exactly how your life will look. It'll start with a baseline ultrasound. Baseline just means that starting scan. And I like to do it maybe a couple days before your period will start, especially if it might start on a weekend. Otherwise, ton of flexibility. Because if let's say your period starts on a Saturday and you need to start meds Sunday night, well, it's very hard to get medications to someone on a Sunday night. So I just wanna make sure that you're never feeling overwhelmed and rushed and everything can go very smoothly. So that first appointment lasts about an hour to an hour and a half where you're gonna meet with me or one of my assistants to teach you how to mix the medications. What I find is that patients waste a lot of money with medication errors. And um, I was trying to find this, it was hilarious, but I couldn't find it on my phone. It was a snap, I, I just took a screenshot of me uh, I, all my patients get my cell phone number and I tell them to FaceTime me. I tell everyone to do your shots between 7 to 9 p.m. And that's so that I'm not asleep or in my pajamas. So <laughs> I was FaceTiming with someone and I had a mud mask on. And I didn't realize I was covering up my face. Let's just say this is my phone. I was covering up my face on the phone thinking they couldn't see me. But really, I should have been covering up the camera. So I'm sorry to the person who I was trying to teach how to do your shots or trying to fix the medication error that you almost made. My apologies in advance. So whenever people say IVF, I mean, you think of these big hypodermic needles. I mean, I'll show you one. Here's an example of a needle. This is what everyone thinks. And that's going to go in your butt. But nothing goes in your butt in my office. It's a good joke, right? So 
the reality is the needle looks more like something like this, okay? It's much, much smaller and it goes in the skin of your tummy. So exactly where tummy? It really doesn't matter. I mean, you have less sensory nerves in the lower part, so it hurts less if you go in the skin of your tummy. And most patients say, I cannot give myself the shot. It actually hurts less if you are giving yourself the shot. If someone is coming at you with a needle, it might hurt more than if someone, let's say, prepares it for you and brings it to you or you prepare it for yourself. Each shot will take about 15 minutes or so for you to prepare. And no, this guy does not come to your house to do your shots for you. He doesn't. So we teach you how to mix your medications. And if you ever have any questions at all, you call. You don't go to Google. You don't go to YouTube. You don't phone a friend. You call me because your medications and making sure they're right is actually the most important thing to me. There's only one time I get annoyed. I get annoyed when people don't ask a question. That's when I get annoyed, if people make a mistake because they think that maybe they're gonna bother me, but I only get bothered if you don't bother me. So, you saw that original calendar, right? So, once your period does start, if let's say we were doing a natural cycle start, we would then make another calendar for you that tells you exactly what to do every single day. We'll sit down at that baselight appointment. That appointment is in three stages. Stage one is, or step one, is ultrasound to make sure no cysts, do a blood draw, okay? Then a meeting to review the protocol. And that protocol kind of depends on your follicle count that day. So if your follicle count is, let's say, over 15, I would consider lower dose of medications. If your follicle count is, let's say, under five, well then maybe perhaps we'll consider a more natural cycle start or a hybrid, or a natural cycle I should say, or a hybrid cycle using fertility pills with injections. So on, on this uh, calendar right here, what you'll see, whoop, I feel like a weather girl, okay. So on this calendar right here, you'll see that I use a medication. Oh, look at my hand, <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> I think that's way too much fun. I can't stop. Okay, I'll stop. So I use a combination of letrozole. You should see my producer and director here. I think they're peeing in their pants. I think they need a glass of relax. Yes. In my cup. Dr. Amy at your cervix. There you go. I know. It looks awkward the way I'm holding it. But I'll get this. I'll get this right. Okay. So letrozole is also known as Femera. It's used for breast cancer prevention. And unlike Clomid that requires an exorcism, I promise you it does, it has less side effects. It lasts in your system only two days also. So, you know, like a lot of meds, some patients will have hot flashes, mood changes, nausea, vomiting, you know. But for the most part, Femera doesn't have those side effects like Clomid. But I would say that there are maybe one out of 10 patients that will actually have lower leg cramps. It's actually not an insignificant uh, side effect that people report. So I combine the fertility pills for five nights with fertility shots and you come in a lot. It's not just, oh, start your meds, see you in seven days. I mean, I see some people after just two nights of meds, after three nights of meds, after five nights of meds, and the decision when to come back in is really determined by what's going on with you. What have we learned from your prior cycles? Are you someone that makes a follicle really, really fast? Well, I wanna see you earlier so that we can start the antagonist. And on this calendar right here, it's the, um, oh, I'm gonna do that again. Oop, cetratide right there. <laughs> Way too fun. Um, so the cetratide right there would actually slow the follicle growth. So going down the list, you have the Femara, which is a fertility pill, Menopur, which is the FSH, and LH hormone. Remember in the beginning, I said that we have to give patients a higher signal of these hormones that their brain sends to their ovary, so they ovulate more than one egg. And then the estradiol blood test is something that we do at each visit because we like to watch the rate of rise because we expect approximately a doubling every, with every visit um, just to track the follicle growth. And then the ultrasound also guides us about the sizes and when to start the antagonist, also known as cetratide. And there are, there are a number of brands to these medications, but basically the antagonist refers to a medication to slow down the growth and prevent the egg from actually leaving the ovary, okay? So the next thing that you'll see on there is actually something called human growth hormone. 
Another name for it is Omnitrope, that's the generic version. Brand name is Saison. So I offer growth hormone basically to any patient who I might think has lower egg quality. So I have a fun slide, but I'll show it to you in a second. Um, but before I do that, I just want to show you another example of other protocols. So I do have patients that are on actually much higher doses of medication. So they're taking straight FSH hormone, and the brand names for that, oh, that one does that too, is Folistem and Gonal F. So those are the different brands for straight FSH with Menopure at night. So I do um, sometimes have patients do twice daily dosing, but for the most part with me, it's one shot a night every night for approximately 10 nights, a total of five visits from start to end. So here is uh, another example of a straight Menopure protocol and this is one shot a night. And then the way we teach patients how to do medications is while you might be taking up to three, maybe even four different injectable forms of medication, we actually teach you how to mix them all together in one shot so you never have to give yourself more than one shot or feel like a human pin cushion. So back to HGH, when I say, oh, I want you to take HGH, everyone thinks, oh, I'm gonna get taller, I'm gonna get buffer, I'm gonna, you know, all those things. No, I mean, basically it's an anti-aging supplement. So the thought is that it might help with egg quality, it might help a woman get one extra egg. It, it doesn't seem to hurt, it just hurts your pocketbook because it's rather expensive and most insurance companies would, will not cover it, even if you have coverage with IVF. I mean, there are the lucky few who have the coverage for the HGH. So I offer HGH to every woman automatically over 40, any woman regardless of age with an elevated FSH level, and anyone who, let's say I sense might have lower egg quality, for example, someone with a history of endometriosis. So that's who I would offer HGH to. So when it comes to the secrets of IVF stimulation, I think the most important thing is to ask questions, ask more questions, and ask why. Why are, you know, ask your doctor, why am I doing IVF? If you don't know the answer to that question, you should know. Is there anything that I can do to make my chances better or higher? Why am I taking the meds that I'm taking? Why did you pick this protocol for me? So my patients know the answers to those questions. And I find when I see patients who come from all over, and let's say they've done multiple IVF cycles, and I ask them, well, why did you have to do IVF in the first place? And they say, well, I don't know. I think it's important to know, because ideally I like to set up each patient so that they have the best chance for getting pregnant without my help. So if I can give people an idea as to what they can do on their own to give themselves the best chance, whether it's, let's say, losing weight, making sure the triglyceride level is low, um, then perhaps the egg quality is going to be even better, even if we end up doing IVF. So that's my philosophy as far as IVF stimulation. So I thought I would um, close by just showing you, Paula, interrupt me if I have any questions. Um, questions at all. Somebody's asking, oh, okay. did, did I hear anti-aging? Yes, you did hear <laughs> anti-aging. And I would say that um, there's a lot of exciting stuff. And I'm, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, anytime, you know, I have Google alerts for everything, but I feel like there is something that women are going to be able to use as a tool to p potentially um, slow down ovarian aging or reverse it altogether. I feel like we're so close. I can't imagine that um, egg freezing is gonna be something that women will need to do to preserve their young egg. So I'm very hopeful. So until that time, get your levels checked. Get your levels checked and get your levels checked. And then freeze your eggs if it's right for you. Somebody else says they love the stems. I don't know exactly what that means. They love the stems. Um, it could mean a number of things, right? Mm -hmm. We are not getting into sex toys, Paula. No. We are not. Not this week. Not this week. However, if you stay tuned in about two months, and I'm totally serious, we are coming out with a version of fertility pants. Now let your mind go where you would like it to go, because that's probably exactly what we're doing. But we're not going to demonstrate. Someone else asked. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, are there other supplements you recommend for women going through IVF? I do. I do have my hocus pocus list of supplements and it's individualized for the patient. So I ask patients to consider taking acai berry, resveratrol, depending on their situation, DHEA, 
ovacetol and the other equivalent would be something like Pregnitude, a really great prenatal with fish oil, melatonin, and people look at me again like I've lost, like, Amy, I, I have no problem sleeping. Why are you telling me to take melatonin? And the reason is there are some studies that suggest as a very potent antioxidant, it can also help with uh, egg quality. And then in some cases, turmeric as well. So at the end of the day, when I go through this list of supplements, it can be upwards of 15 different tablets someone needs to take, because I also tell people exactly what doses to take as well. But I've been so lucky to help patients even um, uh, over the age of, let's say, 44 with their own eggs. And I don't know if the supplements helped, but they certainly didn't hurt at all. Another one. Yeah. Facebook is going nuts. Okay. That's exciting. Okay. Should I, should, someone did say. Hey. I think they want me to drink some of the relax. <laughs> Just relax, people. I don't someone know why. Said, I think it's stop them. it with the crotchless pants. You're I swear. Woman. No, it's coming. I was going to wear them tonight just to prove to people, but I thought that would be kind of weird, especially oh. if children were watching. Yes, not on Facebook. No. Uh, for egg quality, is that determined even before stims? Absolutely. So there are, like I said, fertility gene tests that you can do to see if you have, let's say, a gene for uh, POI or primary ovarian insufficiency. So women with that gene may have lower egg quality. So yes. And the other tests that you can do are the levels. You know how I keep saying, get your levels checked, get your levels checked. Hi, I'm Amy, get your levels checked. FSH, estradiol, AMH. So if your FSH level is close to 10 or even above 10, that's a suggestion that you might have lower quality than you, than, or, or I should say that you should do IVF because hopefully you have good eggs, but maybe not all of them will be of the highest quality. So whatever you can do beforehand to basically give your eggs the best chance. And the other thing is there's this idea that you have to be on these things for three months or six months in order to take effect. And the reality is that we're born with all the eggs that we'll ever have. Eggs aren't like sperm. You know, the sperm life cycle is about two months or so. So a guy can positively impact his sperm quality by basically taking supplements or doing things like losing weight, um, changing lifestyle uh, habits. But our fertility isn't skin deep. It doesn't matter how awesome you look on the outside, if you start your supplements now, that's the best thing that you can do for your cycle, even in two weeks, six weeks, or eight weeks from now. We do have a couple more on okay. Facebook. We okay. see you guys there, but yeah. there's also been someone waiting online from Los Angeles. So okay. Let's bring them on. Okay. Hello, Los Angeles. You are with us. Hi, Los Angeles. <laughs> Hi, this is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. You know, I went to UCLA. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, and you're in L.A., <laughs> yeah, and I went to UCLA. I'm sitting in traffic right now, so I'm trying to relax, like you Okay, said. yeah, don't drink the wine. <laughs> so um, I, I got my level checked, just okay. like you said. Um, I had like a 1.3, I think, uh -huh. um, yeah. AMH level. Yeah. And then, Lisa, and how old are so you? Do you mind sharing how old you are? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm 34. Okay, so you're 34, AMH 1.3. So, you know, the thing is, what this tells me is that you are most likely fertile right now. But if you're someone who wants more than one child, what I would suggest to you is considering doing something to preserve your fertility. Because what I see so often is women, you know, they, they get pregnant very easily for baby number one, and they show up at my door at 37 or 38, and then they say, okay, I'm ready for baby number two. And then I say, well, your AMH is now 0.3. And they look at me and say, but baby number one was so easy. So, you know, I want you to reach your goals and have the family size that you want. And I want that for everybody. But one of the many things that I tell people is plan your fertility like you would the most amazing vacation and the way you would plan, let's say, your retirement. So take the time to talk about what your goals are and do what you can now because women have a finite supply of eggs. So your levels, to me, are reassuring. And if I were to kind of predict maybe how many eggs would be retrieved in an IVF cycle, you can take an AMH level and say, well, uh, probably close to 10 eggs would be retrieved if you were to need IVF. Do you know if there's, are you guys actively trying to conceive right now, Lisa? Uh, well, actually, I was just going to say that um, that's funny you said 10 would probably be average because um, I'm in, I was in, well, I should say was, was in a cycle yeah. um, and being stimulated, but I was only five days into taking the shots, yeah. and they said that I was at risk for hyper stimulation. Okay. And so they made me get off the hormones, okay. 
and take a Lubron shot. Mm -hmm. I did that on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then they said they want to check me for PCOS. Interesting. So I would say that an AMH level of 1.3, so, you know, when I look at a patient, you're, you're never a number to me. So it's a combination of the hormones, the ultrasound, your age, and all together. So when you look at someone's ovaries, and if it's not consistent with the AMH level that you see, something's off, and it's usually the AMH level. So I've actually had that before where I saw a patient, I was like, you have so many follicles, it's not consistent with your AMH level, and you just repeat the AMH and you realize that that actually, it was probably not handled appropriately when the blood was drawn, let's say it wasn't spun in, in the right amount of time or run within a certain period of time needed to get an accurate level. But that's good because it sounds like you were followed very, very closely and um, taken care of in a very safe way. And Lupron is one of the many things that we do for women to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And are you feeling well? Because it sounds like this is all very recent for you. Yeah, I was this week. Well, I mean, I was started on 250 mm-hmm. uh, Follistem, I think. Uh-huh. Or maybe it was gone last. Okay. And um, and then it uh, it basically they thought it was too high I and see. that I had a monster follicle. Oh, interesting. So if you had a monster follicle, um, sometimes uh, that means that you had one what we call lead follicle that was preventing the other follicles from growing. So um, when when you do IVF and you learn early on that this might not be the very, very best cycle. So my philosophy is when I do a cycle, I say to myself, am I giving this person their very best chance? As if I only get one chance to do it right. And so if there's something early on from the stimulation that makes it seem like this cycle isn't going to be the very best for them, it's a good call to tell the patient, and that's what I do, and it sounds like that's what your doctor did too, and consider perhaps maybe not moving forward. And I don't like to use the word cancel. I like to use the word, well, we learned from this cycle, so we're going to take these lessons, so next time they're going to do something differently, I'm sure, for you. Did they tell you what they were going to do differently next time? Yeah, they said they were going to reschedule me and do like 150, a little bit less. Okay. They think that I was too responsive. Yeah. I bet your AMH is actually 13, not 1.3. You have to call us back and tell us, but I have a feeling I'm right about that. Okay. 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 Well, at least I have a safe drive. Thanks. I know it's LA, cause, and uh, you're probably not moving very fast. But let us know if you see a yeah, celebrity a while you're on the freeway. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Bye. Thanks, Lisa. Um, there are a couple other questions on Facebook. Okay, let's but, answer it. Okay, uh, it's jumping over there. What are your thoughts on acupuncture during IVF? I recommend acupuncture to everybody. Um, people ask me why, and I say, well, it's been around for thousands of years. They have to know what they're doing. Um, we have uh, great acupuncture uh, centers around us in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco, San Jose, San Ramon, Lafayette, Arinda, Berkeley, Oakland. They're everywhere, and um, I make recommendations to patients based on where they live, where they work, and what's most convenient to them. So I tell everyone, at least go do a consult, because like I said, I want you to do your IVF cycle one time and never look back and say, I wish I would have done something differently. So if you hate it, don't do it again. But if you, if you loved it, I want you to do it with your cycle. And patients ask me, well, what protocol? What, what, how often should I go? I say, well, they're the experts. Here's the calendar that I made for you. Give it to the acupuncturist and then tell them, work your magic. Make Amy look really good. I'm just kidding. Um, actually, I, that is exactly what I say. So I want the acupuncturist to be able to communicate with me whenever they have questions, and they often do. They ask me what the follicle sizes are, what the hormone levels are. They want to see the FSH levels, and I work very closely with acupuncturists in our area. And there's also a great acupuncture book, I can post the link later, that's all about fertility and acupuncture, written by one of my fertility doctor friends, Dr. Laura Shaheen. It's a great resource that I send to patients. It's a really good, uh, very uh, nice read that talks about all the fertility benefits. Other question. Uh, let's see. Do you believe put, do you believe in putting a patient on a higher than recommended dose for DOR if that will help produce more eggs? For example, a dose of 750 FSH versus 400. Right. So imagine a cup of coffee. Hello, <laughs> cup of coffee. Just in case you are just coming on and want to see my 
cup of coffee. So um, imagine coffee and you're putting sugar. I don't have a spoon, but I'll pretend with my syringe. I'm putting sugar in my coffee. There's only so much sugar that will actually um, melt in or saturate at the bottom of the cup. After a certain point, there's a super saturation point where that there's, there's no more sugar that you can add. The sugar just collects at the bottom. It doesn't dissolve. So that's kind of like fertility meds. It seems like 300 units of medication is that point where anything above that might um, just be a total waste of money. And the problem is, um, I'm not Wonder Woman. I can't create eggs if you don't have them. I can only work with the eggs that you have. And when you have a certain number of follicles or eggs, I know they look like testicles, but they're actually eggs. They were supposed to be white, but they came tan. So that's what we call them, stressies and stressicles. So there is a certain number of eggs that a woman has. And when you do IVF, you don't actually help a woman create more eggs. So if your starting point is, let's say, three eggs, then you want to give the dose that's appropriate to grow the three eggs. But what I find is that blasting someone and screaming at the ovaries, hence whisper, right? Um, by talking slowly or softly to the ovaries first and getting all three to grow, then bringing in the stronger shots, for me, seems to um, uh, be better for patients when it comes to trying to extract every single egg uh, that they have in that cohort if you have DOR. And for those of you who don't know what DOR is, what I tell people that DOR is not depleted ovarian reserve, it's actually decreased ovarian reserve, and DOR does not mean donor. So I want every patient to be their own egg donor and not have to use an egg donor. And I don't believe in FSH discrimination either. So no matter what your FSH is, no matter how many eggs you have, in my office, we believe in the fertility of every single patient, no matter what your hormone levels are. We want to give everyone a chance. We have two more. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What is your opinion on natural cycle for DOR women? I do natural cycles for all DOR women. That's just kind of what I do. It doesn't make sense to give someone something to suppress their ovaries, like let's say birth control pills, because we know from studies and just from experience that giving birth control pills makes the follicle count less and you'll end up with less eggs. So when you have already a smaller supply of eggs, you should do everything possible to maximize the chances that you'll get every single egg to grow. So that's my answer. No suppression for DOR patients. You know, some people like S-trace priming, um, and it sounds, like I said, really sexy and awesome. Oh, I'm going to prime your ovaries with estrogen, and we're going to make those eggs better or more. But I don't find that that really, um, I don't really find that to be the case. I think S-trace priming can sometimes help with preventing the lead follicle. But other than that, I feel like a straight natural cycle, maybe coming in earlier, starting the cetratide earlier, seems to be the best uh, in my hands. And again, in my hands. So you have to do what your fertility doctor thinks is best for you, for your body, because they know your body better than some woman up here who's talking about crotchless pants. <laughs> um, and for the last question, yeah. do you recommend PGD slash PGS for all women with diminished egg quality? Yes. So imagine you're pregnant with an abnormal pregnancy and you have DOR and then you find out after four months that potentially the pregnancy has stopped because it has a chromosomal issue. So that's heartbreaking, but you can never get that fertile window or fertile life back. So that's basically wasted time where you could have been trying for pregnancy. I understand that doing genetic testing is expensive, but the, what, the way I describe genetic testing is it's as close as, to the IVF, as close as a crystal ball in IVF medicine that you can get. It's not perfect, but if a patient can afford it and do it, and it's something that they have um, no ethical issues with. I do think that PGS, which stands for pre-implantation genetic screening, is something that every patient should consider. Um, embryos are not like diamonds, and I think it's really hard for human beings because we look at an embryo and we see how pretty it is, and we want to believe that it's also pretty on the inside. But an embryo can be gorgeous on the outside and genetically not viable on the inside, and not transferring it can save patients from a lot of heartache and miscarriages, and I don't, I don't like miscarriages. They're the enemy. Miscarriages and periods. We don't like periods. Periods are an emergency in my office. We don't like them. That's everything Okay. Facebook. Okay. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. So remember, get your levels checked, get your levels checked, get your levels checked. And if you have a hard time getting someone to get your levels checked, go to eggwhisper.com and join us next Wednesday for another show. And we're going to have a lot more fun. I'll find more props to show you. So 
come back and tune in to see what wacky props I have next Wednesday. Have a great night.